Welcome to the seventh meeting of the Social Security Committee uh, in the, this session and remind everyone to turn mobile phones off and other devices as they may disrupt the broadcasting. Um, we have received apologies from Adam Tompkins today. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. Are members content to take uh, item five, the work programme in private? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item two and three are uh, on the Council Tax Reduction Scotland mm -hmm. Amendment Regulations 2018. Agenda item two is a consideration of the following negative interest instrument, the Council Tax Reduction Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018 SSI 2018 stroke six nine. And I would like to welcome to committee this morning Robin Haynes, of Head of Council Tax at the Scottish Government. And um, if I could open today by inviting Mr Haynes just to lay out uh, the purpose of these regulations. Thank you, convener. Good morning and thank you for inviting me to be here today. Um, the, the, uh, the larger part of these regulations provide the annual uprating of the various allowances and premier within the council tax reduction scheme. Um, the Scottish Government has introduced such legislation each year uh, in order to maintain the original policy intention of the council tax reduction scheme, or CTR scheme if you forgive my shorthand, uh, which, which was to ensure that nobody would be worse off as a consequence of uh, the abolition of council tax benefit in 2013. Now, historically, the entitlement criteria for housing benefit and council tax benefit were pretty much identical. So by broadly continuing to track the UK government's changes to the entitlement criteria for housing benefit, even though the legislative underpinnings of the two policies are profoundly different, um, helps to ensure that the CTR scheme continues to fulfil that original policy intention. Um, in saying that, the Scottish Government does recognise that there are now a few ways in which things do now uh, diverge, but in the main, uh, the continuing alignment of the two policies also has the additional advantage of uh, keeping things a bit easier for those who have to navigate the council tax reduction and housing benefit policies. By that, I mean people who have to apply for either or both and those who administer them. Uh, indeed, there is, in fact, one such divergence within the regulations in front of the committee this morning. Regulation 7, page 3, will allow an application to, uh, by someone of working age for a council tax reduction to be backdated with good cause by up to six months, whereas the equivalent provision for housing benefit remains at one month. The Scottish Government is introducing this change to address circumstances that seem to be arising as a consequence of the Department of Work and Pensions rollout of universal credit. In essence, there seems to be difficulties arising with ensuring those who make a claim for universal credit are made aware that they need to make a separate claim for council tax reduction and how that individual might set about making that application. And as a consequence, in some areas, and most especially where universal credit full service is being rolled out, there is some evidence that the number of council tax reduction applications is lower than might be expected. So in other words, there is evidence of people who have little or no means of paying their council tax not applying for the reduction that they would otherwise be entitled to, and consequently their council tax accounts fall into arrears. Uh, that's in nobody's best interests, and Regulation 7 is intended to help such individuals and councils uh, prevent this situation arising. Uh, committee will also note that Regulation 3 introduces a new provision for applicants in receipt of universal credit. Um, this allows local authorities to, in effect, estimate a person's council tax reduction over a period of time if that, if that person's income is subject to frequent change. Um, this is intended to allow a local authority really just to be pragmatic when a person earns different amounts each week, each month. Um, there's, in fact, a very similar provision in the principal scheme regulations for other categories of applicant. So at present, as the law stands, any change to earnings and thus the universal credit award requires a council tax reduction and uh, consequent council, residual council tax liability to be recalculated. And universal credit links to HMRC's real-time information system 
means local authorities now know far more of changes to such circumstances than they ever did before. Uh, and this can result in an individual's council tax bill being reissued and recalculated every month. And sometimes those corrections are put into the system more than every month. Uh, and the result is it is simply unclear how, to that person how much they're expected to pay. You know, if, if, I, if I was in that situation, you know, I'm not sure I would be content to allow a direct debit for my council tax if I had no idea how much it would be each month. Um, more acutely so if my monthly finances uh, were a bit more precarious. From the local authority perspective, this means um, that, they've, uh, that, that they have a council tax account that falls into arrears because the person doesn't know how much they owe, but because the account is subject to incessant rebilling, the local authority can't initiate any recovery proceedings. Um, however, if it were possible for a representative, representative figure to be identified for that person's earnings, and therefore that allows their universal credit award to be estimated and thus, the most importantly, their net council tax liability to be calculated over a period of time. And both the applicant and the local authority could avoid the uncertainties from a relentless rebilling and recalculation that seems to be happening at present. Uh, thank you. I think that's all I'd, uh, I actually have to say, but I'll be very pleased to try and answer any questions as best I can. Thank you. Um, do members have any questions? Mr Griffin? Thank you, Camila. Uh, morning, Mr. Haynes. Um, just had a couple of questions around backdating. Um, from what I understand, um, backdating for uh, working age applicants mm. is, goes back to six months and they have to provide um, continuous good mm. cause to show why that should be backdated. But for older people, they can only apply for backdating of one month but don't have to show continuous good cause. Can I ask why there's the discrepancy between working age and older people and whether there was any consideration to, to equalise that to make things um, simpler for all applicants? Sure. Um, first of all, um, if you forgive me, uh, can I just correct one thing you said? for um, applicants for council tax reduction who have reached pension credit age, um, backdating is three months, not one month. Uh, and they, there's no requirement for good cause to be demonstrated uh, there. Uh, whereas for pe persons of working age, um, when the scheme was originally created in 2013, it was six months with good cause and pension age, it was three months without good cause. And that was a straight lift from the council tax reduction, sorry, the council tax benefit regulations um, entitlement criteria that I referred to earlier. Um, it was for working age uh, applicants, I think it was in 2016, in a change that was intended to reflect the housing benefit changes. Um, uh, there was an amend there were amending regulations went through that moved it from six months to one month for people of working age. Pension age was unaffected. And as I described in my opening remarks, that's proving to be a bit of a problem. So in effect, we've left pension age uh, backdating um, provisions unchanged from the original 2013 scheme. Um, for persons of working age, effectively, we're talking about a measure to fix a known problem. Um, and that, uh, I suppose you could say that's, that's the Scottish Government acting um, to, to fix a known problem. We've had no evidence that the differing, the differing um, criteria for persons of pension credit age causes a problem at all. And by, but by no evidence, I mean um, we do engage with the welfare advice and rights uh, groups. We also engage with practitioners at COSLA and both the IRRV. And indeed, um, a lot of circumstances come to light from ministerial correspondence when people um, come to your constituency surgeries. And we have had no evidence that the provisions for individuals of the, the three month backdating provisions for individuals of pension credit age is a problem. Whereas we had did, it, it was brought to our notice that for people of working age, there was a problem emerging. And I would emphasize it's not the same there is this good cause provision uh, in the working age provision. So, and there's quite a lot of case law that determines what is and isn't good cause. So <laughs> be extreme, couldn't be bothered, isn't good cause. 
but having material difficulties navigating the system might be. Whereas for individuals of pension age, if they were entitled three months ago, it's automatic that their CTR claim application rather is backdated. Okay. How are the, the changes to the rules around backdating for working age applicants being communicated? How are people being made aware of that? Um, so the easy bits, the practitioner community, we have good communications uh, both through COSLER and directly with local authorities and also through their, um, their professional organisation, the IRRV, that has a very active and well-read forum. That's the easy bit. Communicating it to individuals, I suppose, um, takes us straight into the terrain I described, that where somebody has made a universal credit application, things seem to be falling through the cracks. Um, uh, job centres, for example, in the Universal Credit Journal, that people just don't know um, that they have to make a separate council tax reduction application to a local authority. So um, at present that is a problem and we're, we're trying to identify means of addressing that. Local, some local authorities have different approaches and there seems to be different approaches within different job centres even. Um, but I suppose you could say that the, the moving it to six months just gives a safety net for where that has fallen in the cracks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms McNeill. Uh, good morning. Um, first to say, I think the regulations are extremely welcome. You can see that um, applied to make a deal of difference. I wanted to ask you about the it's a very complicated aspect, which is Regulation 3, estimating the income of universal credit claimants. So new regulations would allow a local authority to make its own estimate of an applicant's household income if it's subject to frequent change during a period of entitlement. Um, so I suppose the first question is obvious. What, is, is there guidance to be issued about how local authorities have to interpret uh, what is meant by frequency? Um, no, and in fact there's no guidance to local authorities about how um, they should or shouldn't apply council tax reduction. And in saying that, it sounds quite blunt, but um, it's a very much a contrast to council tax benefit which was based on local authorities managing DWP's money. Um, and um, it's, it's the same case for housing benefit, and that persists, that DWP um, gives local authorities any amount of guidance and instruction, and there's a real sense of control about what local authorities do. Council tax reduction is intentionally very different. Um, the law is the law, but how local authorities interpret that law is a matter for them. Obviously, there's, there's the ultimate legal test around that. Um, but also to give some comfort, um, uh, we would hope that local, well, we would hope, we expect and we know that local authorities have some experience in applying the equivalent provision, um, which I think is Regulation 29.3, um, for uh, other applicants, usually of, um, the, the sort of cohort that we're talking about is usually people who are on um, tax credits. So this regulation that allows a local authority to estimate in, um, a council tax reduction by averaging in, uh, income over a period of time is very much a measure to give local authorities scope to fix a known problem. Um, and it's about allowing local authorities to administer such cases more sensibly than the current law requires them to do, as I explained at the beginning. Um, presently, whenever there is a change of circumstance communi communicated to that local authority, it has to crank the handle and rebuild. And it's to give local authorities just a means of managing the council tax reduction scheme in a pragmatic way. But that could result in local authorities applying it slightly differently then? Um, absolutely. And um, so the law is the law. Um, and it is open to interpretation, and it may well be that there are local authorities that apply other elements of the CTR scheme slightly differently. Um, there are 32 local authorities. There's four, essentially four IT platforms that local authorities can choose um, to help them operate the council tax reductions um, scheme, and I surmise that there are already granular differences, but the, the policy, the prevailing policy, is one that should apply across Scotland. It's the interpretation of the law that may indeed differ. 
but um, again, it's about local authorities man using that law to manage their own tax, pay tax base uh, and ensure that no one is disadvantaged within their communities. And just to clarify, I think you said that um, local authorities already apply regulation 293, which is the similar principle then, is it? Yes, and that's, uh, so that's been in from 2013 and yes, it was so in the council. you would expect most local authorities to follow that then, would you? Um, Although they don't have to. Uh, I, think, I think you put it well there. They don't, <laughs> they don't have to. It's to give scope for just a pragmatic approach. As I tried to explain, it's in no one's interest if no one knows how much council tax they're due. Um, but if a local authority is able to apply the law and reach some accommodation with the applicant that seems sensible to both parties, then everyone wins. But at present, the letter of the law requires that council tax account to be recalculated for every single change in earnings. Can I ask a further question? Yeah, um, so I'm interested in, um, so what information gathering will, will take place? Would there be additional burdens on applicants or on local authority staff in order to deal with this question of um, income, frequency of income? Um, so the council tax reduction principle regulations are absolutely not prescriptive about the evidence and information um, that uh, a local authority can say it requires. Um, however, paradoxically, one of the one of one of the reasons this problem it seems to um, uh, have manifested itself is the information flows from. Uh, the universal credit system to local authorities. There's almost too much of it, if, if you like. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms McGuire. Good morning. Um, it's on that, that same section in terms of um, estimating income, and I, I totally get that it's you know, pragmatic and it fixes, fixes something. I suppose I'm just thinking about um, constituents who might need that and what happens if the estimate is wrong and they receive too much. Um, obviously, that's something that, and you mentioned um, tax credits, and there was quite a lot of examples of people being put in quite difficult financial um, situations, having to repay back um, money. So I'd be interested to hear your comments on, on that. Um, so I, I think the best response I can give is that local authorities at present do seem to be managing the, council tax the present council tax reduction scheme in a pragmatic way. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd be just wrong if I said, you know, I'm sure everything's rosy in the garden. I'm sure there's, uh, there's plenty of cases that all of you will find in your constituency where things haven't gone quite right. Um, but if I was to take one performance metric, which would be the, the number of appeals that the Council Tax Reduction Review Panel um, sees, um, the case, their caseload is something like one-fifth of what it had been for Council Tax benefit before. Um, so that would suggest to me that whilst the circumstances that you describe would be undesirable, um, and as I said, I'm sure there's plenty of cases where things aren't going quite right. The generality is that local authorities do seem to be able to take a pragmatic approach. I suppose, though, if what we're, what we're doing with this is increasing the number of people that are getting it and that, and that some people that we spoke about with um, own universal credit are falling through the, the cracks, if the numbers are going to increase, there's more chance of, of that happening. So I, I suppose, uh, or maybe that's unfair, there's not more chance of it happening, but we're, we're increasing the numbers. Will it be down to individual local authorities to decide how they deal with recouping these overpayments, or is there anything in the legislation? Uh, yes, it is up to local authorities. We are not prescriptive about that. Um, but as, as I said, I would, I would hope that um, pragmatism can prevail. The point of these measures is to give scope for that pragmatism and allow sensible conversations to happen, as they must already happen for um, legacy benefit cases. And I would have to say that I'm not aware of um, that being a widespread problem. Sure, there are instances of it, but it's not a, there's no evidence to suggest it's a widespread problem for legacy benefit cases. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Griffin wanted a brief supplementary. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Governor. It's still in the area of estimating income and frequent change. And one of those situations where there 
is likely to be frequent changes for someone who is self-employed. And I just wonder if you're able to clarify whether with these new regulations that local authorities will be able to disregard the, what I feel is an unfair minimum income floor for self-employed people where it's assumed that they um, earn a certain um, level of income and their income may well fall below that, whether local authorities will be able to, to disregard that rule and look at their actual earnings when it comes to estimating income? That's a good question. Um, and I, I suppose in part that, uh, you know, I've had to say that the circumstances you describe have not been the problem we've been made aware of yet is a reflection on the rollout of universal credit in Scotland to date, which has largely been, um, been about uh, new applications with fairly simple, not complex circumstances, such as self-employment with varying income. Um, and the council tax reduction scheme calculations of entitlement have very much benefited from the fact that the caseload today has been those uh, less complicated cases. Um, what you have described around the interactions of universal credit and self-employment, um, nevertheless, looks like it could well be a complex problem. So the regulations at present don't seek to address that. Um, but um, myself and colleagues and uh, people more expert than I are already giving some thought as to how we might be able to deal with those sort of circumstances. Thank you. Ms Johnson. Much, convener. Um, I think throughout the process of the Social Security Bill, we've been focusing on, uh, I think, a shared desire to ensure that people access the entitlements to which uh, to which they're entitled. Um, so there's that welcome focus on on making sure that people that we do increase the uptake and running benefit uptake campaigns to make sure that's the case. So I suppose making sure that people have their council tax reduced where that's appropriate is an important part of this as well. You know, it would seem remiss not to focus on, on that at the same time. So uh, we, we've been informed by SPICE that um, uptake statistics aren't collected for the reduction scheme. And I'd just be interested in your views on whether or not there is enough information there about why that might not be the case and also why the scheme cost £20 million less than was allocated in 2016-17. Uh, so, taking, taking the first part of that question um, first uh, on scheme uptake. Um, so, there is no data on the, the proportion of people who might be entitled who um, are or aren't uh, in receipt of a council tax reduction. We know, I suppose I could share some of our pain that we know an awful lot about the CTR caseload but we don't know a huge amount about the people who are not within the CTR scheme. And, and well, there's, we can do some modelling based on various surveys, and that will always have limitations. Um, so it comes to one of um, promotion. So, for example, um, I think uh, in uh, January 2017, when there were some changes to council tax, uh, we agreed with COSLER a text that would be inserted in, that councils would insert into every council tax bill promoting the council tax reduction scheme. Um, there was also work, I think, in autumn last year, um, I think it was marshalled under the, the banner of You'd Earned It, which uh, had some TV campaign behind it, which was about promoting benefits take-up, and the CTR scheme was part of that, and I think that pointed towards um, uh, a financial health check that uh, Citizens Advice Bureau were running. And that was last autumn. We're giving some thought as to what we might do and how we might build upon that. Um, you mentioned that uh, the income foregone, the total income foregone from the council tax reduction scheme is at present less than the amount that's, that's in local authorities' general revenue grant um, in recognition of their operation of the scheme. And I think that's a reflection of the fact that because council tax reduction isn't a benefit, so there's no one-on-one -on -one match between an individual reduction and money that gets added to the general revenue grant, um, the point is that local authorities bear the revenue risk. So when the scheme was first established, 
in April 2013, I think for that year, um, the revenue risk went the other way. Local authorities were not fully compensated. But in subsequent years, the caseload has gone down. Um, and I think the caseload for C the CTR scheme very much tracks um, the wider labour force and claimant count unemployment is actually going down and the CTR case load has gone down and therefore the revenue risk at present is in local authorities favour which is the 20 or so million that you referred to. Thank you convener. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Balfour, yeah. uh, thank you, Convener, uh, and good morning. Thank you. Um, just going back to the estimate of the applicant's income, um, has any research been done across the 32 local authorities to see if there are differentials, or has any evidence been given to Scottish Government by the third sector to show that there are any major discrepancies between certain local authorities? Um, there's no formal piece of research. I can't point to any particular document that exists in our filing system. Um, but what I would say, there's a lot of informal intelligence gathering, if you like, in that myself and my colleagues uh, do work quite closely with um, the practitioner community within local authorities. Uh, and, of course, there's a more formal engagement with COSLA, who also introduce more senior practitioners to, the, to those forums. Um, and we find that each of them, each, each person we speak to recognises that there is some degree of interpretation required uh, and they have to be instructed by the case law that exists around that. And I'm also aware that there are the, the IRV can sell everyone a very good course on how to approach these circumstances. So it's not, not being brought to our attention that there are extremes. Um, sure, there will be variation across the 32 and indeed individuals within the 32. Um, as they manage individual cases. Um, but as I say, there's no, there's, nothing's been brought to our attention to suggest that there are um, disparities that would be worrying. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McPherson. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. With regard to new income disregards, I was wondering whether the carers, carers Allowance Supplement will be taken into account as income for working age, CTR, applicants um, so that doesn't feature in these amending regulations if you like for two reasons um, reason number one is ministers have yet to reach review and it's our job as civil servants to produce a suitable analysis to make sure that um, any decision made is an informed one uh, and I suppose the second one was if a minister if ministers had made that choice um, the Carers Allowance Supplement doesn't exist in law yet, so making reference to something in regulations now uh, to something that doesn't exist yet um, isn't quite possible. Just wait to close that off. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? I mean, just oh, going back to that question, because within the next year, Carers Allowance Supplement may well come in. So what happens in that period between the, any new regulations happening or will regulations have to be brought forward new regulations be brought forward on this once the carers allowance supplement is in and ministers have come to a view on that uh, so good question um, if ministers take the view that they would wish the carers allowance supplement and indeed any other future devolved benefit uh, to be treated in a particular way then uh, we would have to come forward with further amending regulations come forward it wouldn't be included um, so the working um, council tax reduction for persons of working age treats everything as income unless it is specifically disregarded so to disregard the carers supplement the, uh, the care allowance supplement um, we would have to introduce regulations that specifically excluded it from the calculation of income okay. content Mr Balfour yeah. content no further questions. Well, no, I've got no further questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I ask members if they are content to note the instrument or if they wish to make recommendations and report on the instrument? Content to note? Content to note. Thank you. 
Um, uh, can I thank uh, Mr Haynes for his attendance at committee this morning and I'll suspend briefly while we change uh, the panel. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we now move to agenda item four, which will be an evidence ses session on benefit automation. And um, submissions from Nahid Hanif and Richard Gass were circulated separately on Monday. And I would like to welcome Richard Gass, Glasgow City Health and Social Care Partnership and Chair of Rights Advice Scotland. Thank you. Uh, to Nahid Hanif from West Lothian Council and to John Campbell from North Lanarkshire Council. A uh, very warm welcome to you this morning. Um, and I would like um, to give you the opportunity to sort of briefly just outline some of the work that you're doing in your own councils uh, in the area of benefit automation. And uh, I'll, I'll miss a gas as far as things. <laughs> Good morning and thank you for inviting me along today. Uh, in, in Glasgow, there's limited automation of benefits. It's uh, restricted primarily to uh, school clothing grants and to free school meals. Uh, these two entitlements are, are managed by a, a single application form. And what has been introduced is now uh, that in subsequent years, a person will be awarded on a, a prior application without the need to fill in a new form. And indeed, for the, the school clothing grant, there was 22,000 recipients of the school clothing grant who had their entitlement uh, uh, continued. However, there was a, a number of folk who were uh, entitled to school clothing grants but not receiving the grant. And by looking at the housing benefit and council tax uh, records, the council was able to identify a further 5,400 folk who ought to have a, a school clothing grant. And a, a, an automated process was put into place whereby uh, a letter explaining what was happening and a, a voucher to pay them by pay point was, 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 was issued. And that was reasonably well received. 87% of the, the recipients cashed their, their vouchers. And when we add those 5,487% 5, of them into the, the overall 22,000, Glasgow now is of the view that 97% take up for school clothing grants. There's an intention in the future to expand, to look at free school meals. But free school meals, you can't send somebody a, a free school meal. You can only give them a, an entitlement to the school meal. And then the onus is on the, the, the parent and child to take that up. We have in Glasgow cashless payments, and uh, they're cashless at, at the till, not necessarily uh, elsewhere. So those who would have to pay for the school meals would bring the money into the school, have it loaded onto their cashless card. Uh, for free school meals, then the money could be put onto their cashless card uh, behind the scenes, but it would still be it would still be visible perhaps in the classroom as to who was physically handing over cash and who was not. There is a perhaps a better scheme, parent pay, and that's been piloted in Glasgow, and I know that there's other local authorities currently using it. Uh, and parent pay is a, a product where all school uh, costs can be paid online. So that could be school trips, uh, after hours activities, and school meals. So this would avoid the need for children to bring cash into the classroom, and that might then remove the, the visible difference between those getting school meals and those who do not. The pilot in Glasgow is over four schools, uh, one secondary, two primaries and one nursery. And in one of the, the primaries, there's already a 92% take up where parents are currently 
loading the card online. So that's something for, for, for the future. Uh, another area where we have uh, semi-automation is in relation to uh, bedroom tax, if we're allowed to call it that. Uh, we in Glasgow uh, mitigate it through DHP, as do other councils. In Glasgow, we do not require folk to make an annual reapplication where there is an initial application, and that will be continued uh, year after year for, for as long as the funding is available. Uh, in relation to the application, we take a, a view that the claimant or the registered social landlord can make the application uh, so to try and avoid people missing out. Perhaps the, the biggest barrier to, to greater automation is, is data sharing, that we have information that we're allowed to use for specific purposes, but to use it for purposes beyond that needs to be compliant with data sharing and protocols and also with the forthcoming GDPR. Uh, there's, from some of the councils that I polled prior to coming here today, there's a degree of concern that with the, the rollout of universal credit, with with housing benefit transferring over to universal credit, some of the data they would otherwise hold will be lost and will be held within DWP systems, albeit some information will still be held within council tax. There will be an element that, that, that is lost. And uh, that we need to be mindful that whatever changes come about, that adequate data sharing protocols and uh, legal frameworks are put in place to enable uh, automation to continue or expand. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Hanif, can I invite you to yes. tell us about West Lothian? Thanks, thanks again for um, inviting me along this morning. Um, really just to reiterate what Richard's been saying as well, in West Lothian we are also um, working with education in terms of the clothing grants to um, make it easier for um, people to put in those applications and get those payments. We've been working with our revenues, our housing benefit um, team, identifying those within those income thresholds and sending out um, a completed forum for them to sign and send back so that that payment is then made to them. So this, this um, kind of academic year, um, we sent out 2,000 um, of these forums, application forums, um, with a return rate of um, 1,358. Um, we then, um, it, it, there was agreement that um, it was quite low and we should try and boost that. We then did a second batch of the same forum um, and got an additional 110. There is some work being undertaken to try and contact the people that uh, we sent the, the, these forums out to and didn't return them. So that's undergoing at the moment. To just fully understand what the barriers are, why people aren't um, returning basically money that we're, <laughs> we're giving them. So um, we're, we're, that work is being undertaken. Again, similar to what Glasgow are piloting, we do have the cards within West Lothian for education for the schools, so that children aren't taking um, money to to schools. They are make, they are doing the payments online as well. Again, um, the take up of that is um, not as high as what we would have liked it to be, but our understanding or our Anecdotal evidence is um, barriers to online um, parents not being um, quite confident using um, online services to be able to upload money and do feel that it's been done securely. So we are working with um, our adult ba basic education teams to be able to, to look at identifying how we help those, those um, that may need some assistance with online support. Um, that's really the big automation, I would say, that we're doing in West Lothian, some semi-automation that we're doing um, in terms of period poverty that I've put in the paper that I issued um, was the um, council executive approved an allocation of 18,000 to pilot a period poverty payment to women that were in, uh, who applied for a crisis grant. Um, the, the Scottish Welfare Fund member of staff would be trained to ask those sensitive questions and if 
there was a need for an extra payment, then an extra £5 payment would be made automatically on top of their Scottish Welfare Fund. So that, that started um, this year um, as well to help um, women with um, purchasing sanitary products. The other thing that um, we've done um, quite successfully is the, the benefit campaign. I mean, again, that's about semi-automation as well. And it's a joint um, initiative involving a range of council services and partnership, um, partnership community planning partners um, within the area to, to engage with families affected by the benefit cap to support them to manage the reduction in their housing benefit. Um, again, using the housing benefit systems, we were able to identify the people that would be affected by the benefit cap. We then, for the ones that we had phone numbers for, we phoned them um, and had the conversation about um, how they would manage and if there was indication that they would have financial hardship because of the cap, they were automatically given the discretionary housing payment for the full financial year. Um, so uh, to help them with their, their finances. If the people that we couldn't get, they were then lettered out, lettered out to. Um, and that 83 household received the DHP um, out of a possible 86, um, I believe, um, for, for the, the cap. Going forward, we are looking at um, how we, we can automate other things make it easier for um, people to get their maximum entitlements. One of the, the things that we're considering just now, again speaking to our housing benefit and Scottish welfare teams, is under universal credit, the 18 to 21 year olds who um, are exempt um, or will get their housing costs paid um, because they fall into a certain criteria will get them paid through the Scottish Welfare Fund. So. We're looking at how we can identify those people and get that payment made automatically rather than having to make wait for applications coming in and, and what have you. So we're, that's something that we're, we're working towards as well. But I would like to take in what um, Richard um, has already said about data sharing, that I, th I do believe more could be, be done, but because of the data sh sharing protocols, again, um, it's, it's difficult to to share the, the, all the information that you need. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And finally, Mr Campbell, about North Lanarkshire. Thank okay, th uh, thank you for inviting me along. I don't know if I have much to say. I think Richard and he's covered it all. <laughs> um, now you see it in my paper in the sense that I, when I originally seen the question, I was actually going to ask, are you talking about automation or self-management? Because I think, you know, you, you have to do one will go with, with the other. Um, in North Lanarkshire then, the really only automation we would have would be around school meals. Yep. Um, other than that, we do similar type work as to what um, West Lothian and Glasgow City Council are talking about in regards to school clothing grant with take up through uh, council services, advice and information and citizens advice bureaus and the independent sector and working closely with the education um, service. Um, we are the council just about to launch a whole digitalisation council services over the next three to, to five years. Um, and welfare is one of the areas that is being looked at to be digitalised. And for me, obviously, you're looking then at housing benefit, council tax reduction scheme, school meals, school clothing grants, blue badges, educational maintenance grants, you know, any sort of kind of welfare sort of kind of benefit that the council administers on behalf of UK Scottish Government or itself would all be considered to be, obviously, look to be self-management. And for an element of self-management, then there would need to be automation at the end of that. Do you know? And I think um, that, that that would be the main aim for the council, looking at that. It, they'll need to consider, obviously, the introduction of universal credit full service that gets rolled out in North Lanarkshire and April, in particular in relation to housing costs. We know through the live service of universal credit that came in in North Lanarkshire in March 2015 that we've seen at the beginning got qu quite a drop in people claiming council tax reduction scheme just for um, some of the things that was the earlier witness was talking about um, that people not making that connection or not being advised that um, so we would always look to do something around that to make sure that um, it was easier and, and seamless for, for folk to, to claim it. Um, the other part would be obviously around the, the data sharing too as well. That that would be an issue. I always have a 
The Council has embarked from a health and social care, looking at a meeting life fees there, self-management system about the life curve, um, what people go through, and then it ultimately directs them to, to different places where they can get uh, information or assistance or advice. Um, but you're, you're relying on in, in people doing that you know, themselves. We certainly have seen from a um, social work perspective that where it is left to uh, claimants or, or their families to, to make claims for benefits at times that you might find that they aren't, um, either the claims are, are not made or they're maybe not made in, in the correct sort of kind of manner. So if there were going to be, my view, automation, it would need to be as easy as, as, as possible, you know, and for me then what that means is, is that at the very first point of contact then all the relevant and correct information, you know, has to be collated. Um, and then obviously it has to be then shared with the different folk who would then allow that automation to sort of, kind of take place. Um, I don't really have anything else to add because I think Richard and Eva have covered um, quite other areas that North Lancashire do too. Thank you. Um, if I, I could just um, drill down a little bit on, on the evidence that you've you've given us. Obviously, um, the whole intention of this from, from your perspective is to maximise people's income and ensure that people are in receipt of everything they're entitled to. Um, but um, I think, um, Saneef, in, in your evidence, you said that um, lettering people, you got some response and then a follow-up response. Is it your feeling that the, the people most in need and hardest to get to are the ones that are still not engaging? With, yeah. Yes, absolutely, because the most vulnerable um, from experience from the advice service, don't open letters, don't read letters, um, because that that's where they are at, at that point in their life. So it, lettering, you don't get a huge response. The telephone calls with the benefit cap that I was talking about had more impact than, than letters. Um, hence why we're doing a little bit of um, information gathering about the clothing grant um, to find out why people hadn't responded. Okay. Would that be the experience across the other two? Yeah, um, certainly when we were doing work around the under officer rule, the bedroom tax and the benefit cap, we found that um, telephoning or texting people um, was get, got a bigger response as to actually writing to people. Um, we, particularly in the sense of the introduction of the bedroom tax, we uh, done a lot of door knocking too as well, do you know, to, to try and encourage people to, to claim their discretionary housing payments. Okay. In Glasgow, in relation to the benefit cap, we had a, a working group involving the residents, the, the registered social landlords, and we divvied up the work that the RSLs would look after their own tenants, and my team would, would attempt to address the benefit cap for the private sector tenants, and we took the view that there was approximately 200 private sector tenants, that we would just write to them, advising them we were coming on a particular date to visit, and that if they wished to, to cancel or to make a rearrangement to do so, but rather than leave the onus with them to, to come forward for advice, advice was going to arrive on their doorstep, we found that more successful than we had done with, with other campaigns. Thank you, Thank you very much. I'm going to bring in Ms McNeill. Good morning. Thank you very much for your evidence. Um, it's clear that um, yourselves and other local authorities are doing incredible work to ensure that people get more people get their benefits. But the committee are really interested in the whole concept of deeper automation or semi-automation. So I just want to first of all just ask you um, what more could be done then if, if the Scottish Government, which I believe are, have already stated the same interest, uh, were to able to take any further action to encourage local authorities to do more, further automation, what do you think needs to be done in relation to particularly the barriers that you talk about, which is data sharing? Can anything be done, do you think? <clears throat> any legislation that the, the Scottish Government introduces needs to address the, the, the legality of sharing information. Obviously, we still have the, the GDPR, so we perhaps need to ensure that the declaration on any application forms is sufficiently clear that information will be used, which is ultimately for, for a person's own benefit. Uh, so certainly making sure that we draft the regulations with our, with our eyes open. And there, there are some areas that we're, we're going to have two parts of the equation to, to, to make the whole sum. When we get the disability benefits devolved, then receipt of the correct 
component of what will be the Scottish DLA, I don't know what the proper title will be, but let's call it that for now, and receipt of the Scottish Carers Allowance, they will then entitle folk to the severe disability premium and or the carers premium within council tax uh, reduction scheme. So we need to ensure that where we've got the two benefits, that the, the connections are there, that a person shouldn't then have to come forward and say, oh, by the way, I've now received DLA. What does that mean for council tax? We should be able to do that or we should put mechanisms in place to ensure that that's done seamlessly and internally. Okay. Anyone else? No, I would agree with Richard, yep. Could you not ask you further to that? Um, so obviously, uh, d depending on your circumstances, you qualify for different benefits, which makes it further complicated in matching those benefits. Um, I was interested in the uptake of free school meals, and Richard, you talked about this, and I think you also did, John. Um, I thought that was one of the more difficult benefits, but it, it's one that I was quite interested to know more about how could... So I know in Glasgow, for example, there's something like 5,500 families um, that haven't taken up their free school meals. And I wondered if you could give the committee any advice or information about how that could be taken forward. We've got, <clears throat> got the answer to your question there, but perhaps a potential barrier is that people don't want to eat the school meal and if you have a free, a free entitlement but your friends are going to take their dinner money instead of going to the school or going to take it down the street then you might not want to go for your free school meal because you're then you know, separating yourself from your peers. So perhaps it's to make the school meal attractive to those who, have, who are buying their school meals and perhaps are a change in thinking about how, how, how catering is delivered in schools might be a, a, a good step forward. But just as a supplementary to that, um, I mean, I, I heard you loud and clear when you, you said that, and I recognise that that is a big issue for free school meals. Um, but can a free school meals be matched up with another benefit, or is it too difficult? Is it, if you, so, do you qualify for housing benefit? You qualify for the school clothing grant, so that's an easy one, so you can match the data. Are there other benefits which you can match the data for free school meals, or is it just yes, so different? If you're claiming housing benefit, that housing benefit application should capture sufficient information to determine right. a, a school meal entitlement. So a, a family could, you could have a system of automation whereby the person's advised of the, the right to a free school meal. Now, if the onus is then on them to go forward and take it up, we've maybe got a, a barrier. If there was a, a scheme allow like the, the the parent pay where they're advised that your your child's payment parent pay card has been uh, automatically credited with the value for free school meals then without them having to do anything other than to turn up at the school and and, and take the meal then that might help just uh, but to qualify for free school meals do they not assess your income and your what you have and um, working families tax credits? Just... You, know, uh, you need to be on uh, means-tested benefits or have a, 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 a tax credit figure below a, a certain figure. Uh, so, but the housing benefit application form should capture, capture that, that, that information. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Adam. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I would just like, to, obviously you've highlighted that in order for automation to go further, its access to data is the most important thing. And the, the, frustration, the frustration I have is I'm on three committees in here now. I don't want you to feel sorry for me with that. But uh, over that period in this week alone, uh, I've actually had uh, justice, education skills, and now today, social security. And we've discussed probably the very same people that we're trying to target in various different aspects of their life. You know, and uh, everyone's come to, we can't get access to the data. The data is there, but we have difficulty accessing it. And almost, John, it sounds as if you're trying to reinvent the wheel with your life card to try and recollect that data that you need to try and get it. Now, how do we, what I want to ask you, is the actual data you need available, but it's elsewhere in someone else's kind of system? And uh, how do we find a way to access that so that we don't end up using resource trying to do something that we already have sitting in some other server somewhere. Because it appears the more we protect people's data, the more, the more difficult we make it to actually help them. You know, and I was just wondering what your thoughts would be on how we actually solve this problem. 
two ways. One would be to have the software developed so that it could identify automatically certain entitlements and issue uh, a letter to the, the households to say, you've claimed housing benefit, we've identified from your housing benefit claim that you also qualify for free school meals, your card for your child's been loaded. If you can update the software, then that's great, but there'll be a, a cost to adapting the software. The other way would then be for local authorities to try and run reports on data they already hold and then have officers go through and uh, process that data to try and then draw up a list of households to whom they either want to write or visit. I've heard this week has been like a lot of it's like DWP have the data and that's the difficulty trying to get access to it. It's already there, but it's difficult for councils or MDLs to get that data. Can get some access to that data, but you're restricted in mm -hmm. what you can use it for. Right. You know, so suppose that again, it's going back to Richard's point about changing legislation that would allow the the information to be shared more easily, obviously, but for the right reasons. Uh -huh. um, but so you can get some access, but it, it's restricted what you can use it for. And I think one of the barriers is also declaration when claimants are signing benefits are signing a declaration to say the information will be used for a specific purpose. So it, there may be scope to go back and look at declarations to, to help them use that data widely. Okay. If I could maybe just come back in. The, there's the, there are data sharing regulations which give local authorities the legal right to access information. And then we enter in uh, a, a memorandum of understanding with DWP. We're then given permission to access their CIS, the client index system, to obtain that information, but for the specific purposes. And they are for administration of housing benefit, council tax, uh, I think school meals are in there, Scottish Welfare Fund, and charging for residential and non-residential care. So those, those areas are there. If there's other, other identified areas, then it maybe needs to be negotiation between the Scottish Government and the Westminster Government to have the data sharing regulations expanded. If there's a duty on, on us to do something, then that perhaps would be the leverage for uh, a change. It's the same answer I've had all week as well. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone's basically said the Scottish Government and Westminster need to sit down and find a way to make it work. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr Griffin? I, mean, I, I, I was particularly interested in the example, uh, Ms Hanif, that, that you provided around the closing grant. Um, and I think that's a massive step forward to some areas where it's basically kids are told at assembly, if you think you might qualify for this, then pick up the forms from the school office and see how you get on. So a, a letter sent to, to those who you know qualify um, with a populated application form is a massive step forward. But what we're talking about here is benefit automation, where benefits are paid to someone who is eligible, regardless of whether they have applied or not. So what is stopping taking the next step and actually not just sending a completed application to be signed, but just sending them um, their entitlement and their uh, school closing grant automatically? I think for West Lothian, it was a it was again the declaration that the, informa the information that they provided to Housing Benefit was used spe specifically to calculate the, the entitlement to Housing Benefit. Now to use it for a, another purpose, for our legal team, um, they felt they needed another signature um, and therefore that's why they chose to do it that way. But So you're saying that they've signed that declaration to use it for that purpose, but you said that you had used that information to identify their eligibility and uh -huh. to populate an application form. That's right. So if if you've been able to do that, then why not just give them... But we also need bank details to be able to put in um, payments and paid into bank accounts as well. So we we don't... No, we didn't have all that information. Um, so, so it's the... And was there no thought to... Sending I mean, a, a, a check yeah, to, to those who this qualified is automatically. First, this is the first time that we've done this, so there is quite a lot of learning um, that we've taken from this. So uh, as we move forward, we're hoping to, to be able to streamline it a bit further. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, it's a, it's a massive step forward so far. I'm just wondering about taking that to the, the logical conclusion of what we're talking about in benefits automation, but thanks very much thanks. For, for that. Yeah. 
come back in. In Glasgow, we did that very thing. We, we looked at our information and we sent out to 5,400 households a pay, a, a, what's it, a pay point voucher and 87% were, were cashed. And I appreciate you know, there's maybe issues over whether or not you've got the authority to do that, but I'm fairly sure it's the Glasgow City Council's declaration on the application form is that the information will be used for other council entitlements. And uh, so we, we managed to over, over, overcome that barrier. And although we didn't have the bank details, we, we used Paypoint, which is what we use for Scottish Welfare Fund and for, for other functions as well. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Any other points on that? Can bring in Mr. Balfour? Can you? Yeah, I, I wanted to just come back to two points and just get a wee bit more information. I mean, uh, IT phobia must be quite a big issue for certain people. Um, well, certainly for me, because in Edinburgh we do have a situation where you pay for primary school, you pay your meals, you pay all your trips online, but there must be a, a fairly reasonable percentage of society who do not have that access and are going to be held back by that. What, what do you do to mitigate that and how do you mitigate that? I think you need to make facilities still available for folk to bring cash into, into the schools. Well, it's not maybe desirable. It can't be the case that if the parent's not able to either access online facilities or is, in, doesn't feel confident to do so, that they then don't make the payment and end up getting a bill or a, a red reminder from the council. So I still think you would need to have a provision within the schools to, uh, to allow uh, cash payments. I mean, you wouldn't I mean, want that as the long-term solution. You want to then provide uh, support yeah. and, and training to, to, to the families, and that would be something the schools could do in what, that some of the parent evenings is uh, you know, demonstrate the, the parent pay mechanism so the parents who aren't confident using it can see how it works and maybe then feel greater confidence to go home and try it themselves. Well, I mean, have you even tried having a laptop at the school and a teacher helping a parent through the process, just there, there and then, and helping them do that. Has that, has that ever happened in any of your local authorities? Okay. And, and the other issue is just in regard to going back to Mr Adams' comment about data and sharing of data and holding data. Are local authorities going to be affected by the new regulations that come in in regard to what you already hold of people um, because obviously as MSPs we've been told that we need to get the permission to hold that information beyond what we have now. Uh, are you going to lose information in the springtime because of this? And secondly, um, how much can you share already between education and health and social care? Is, is that a stimulus thing or do you need people's permission to do that? Glasgow, we feel we're able to share information from the, the authorisation that's on the, the Housing Benefit Council tax application. Whether after GDPR that that declaration is sufficient, I, I can't comment on. I'd like to think it is. If it isn't, it'll need to be revised to make sure that it is but can you, but The information you hold at the moment on somebody, can that be still held after the new regulations come in? The information presumably can still be held within council tax whether on housing benefit, whether there's still permission to share that with education might be the barrier. Uh, and if, inf if education already have information that we've shared, are they allowed to continue to hold that then? If it's no longer compliant with the GDPR, then probably not. So GDPR is going to be a, a headache for us, but hopefully not one that's insurmountable. Do the other two want to comment on? Or, or what, what, cause obviously we're not that far away now. Just what provisions are you making for the beyond beyond the spring summer? I've not really. I, I can't comment. I've don't. There, there is a working group for GDPR and waste loading, but it's not something that I'm involved in, so I don't know if John can. Well, I, um, certainly from a manager's perspective, within North Lanarkshire Council, we've all been given training on the new GDPR and aware of it's coming in, and um, but we will probably have to wait for an. Um, instructions or guidance from the council. Um, I think it, it will cause um, some concern. Um, 
I think it will cause a, a lot of issue, particularly for advice and information services as well, getting um, consent and knowing what it is they can use that information for and what they can't use it for. I mean, there's an element of that there today anyway, but um, I think overall from a council perspective, I think there, there will be major uh, concerns around it about what it holds, how long it can hold it for and who it can share it with. Okay, uh, Ms. Johnson, there, Ms. Johnson, yeah. sorry. Thank you, thank you, convener. Um, Mr. Campbell's evidence suggests that automation could potentially eliminate stigma and, more importantly, value judgments, and that's been discussed already this morning. And I was, I was actually, I, I don't know if I've picked up Mr. Gass incorrectly, but were you suggesting that it is still possible for those who are in receipt of free school meals to be identified by their peers? I would, I, would, I would believe so, because children are very, very intelligent. And if you've got a process at the front of the class where folk are handing over cash for their school meals and certain folk are not being invited to do so are, and yet are getting school meals, then it's probably pretty easy to join the dots. If, however, you've got a mechanism whereby some parents are paying online and only a small number are paying cash at the front of the class, it's maybe less easy to identify the reason for why folk are not handing cash over. I mean, I certainly, obviously it's been a while since I was at school, um, but I do remember that, that double line in, in, in the dining room. And I, I, I think I'd understood that more had been done to make sure that you know that that difference was was being disguised um, better because obviously stigma is a huge part of uh, you know I think we all understand why people are reluctant to take up benefits that clearly uh, you know describe them as being from a, a low income background so um, you obviously feel then that with progress automation could help get rid of some of the stigma if we're really serious about it yes I mean because I, I, obviously it it, it's all in the background. Nobody sort of kind of knows that, that it's happening, do you know, and people would just, do you know, whether it be free school meals or school clothing grant, you know, the, the money sent automatically, the parents are spending it the same way as other parents who uh, aren't eligible for it, do you know, that, and I think then there's no, there's no line there to show that where this money has come from to, to, to pay, do you know, so they, they just like, it would look like everybody else around, uh, around about the community. It's a huge concern, isn't it? Because we're hearing about a lot of free school meals that aren't being taken up, probably by some of our pupils who most need to take them up. Um, with regard to, you know, we, we've recently passed the Child Poverty Scotland Act and it requires the Scottish Government to set out what, if any, measures the Scottish Ministers propose to take in relation to supporting local authorities to consider the automatic payment of benefits and support. Just wondering if you could elaborate on what support might be helpful. What support might local authorities look for that would make this process easier? Well, automation is going to require IT systems that are fit for purpose, and the systems that are there presently perhaps aren't sufficiently fit for purpose. So the, the resourcing of the software upgrade would probably be something that local authorities would be very welcome to have support with. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I can I ask a brief supplementary um, I, and a local interest to me. Obviously, I'm from North Lanarkshire, so um, you mentioned the, the ambitions of the council to redo all of their um, computing systems and make it all automated. Have you been feeding into that process to ensure that whatever comes out the end of that is is going to be fit for purpose for the ambitions of automation and? Uh, Pain benefits? Yeah, we, we have been and we will continue um, to be involved in that process, particularly the area around welfare, do you know, because that's where our interest lies, um, is, is to make sure that people get the benefits that they're entitled to. Um, and, you know, I think the idea would be that there'd be maybe just the one system with one unique reference number with all the details held that would allow not just the welfare but other council activity to happen automatically, do you know? Um, but it is, again, tied up with the self-management side of it, do you know? So it's, it's for me, it's not semi-automation, do you know? Because someone, i.e. the individual, 
the residents going to have to do something first before everything else then falls into place. Do you know, but we, we will continue to feed in it. I mean, my concern is maybe just a bit old fashioned in, in the sense that it's my experience, certainly the Finn North Lanarkshire, seeing uh, claims not being taken up. Um, and, and will we do do a lot of great work in health and social care and housing services do, as well as the, the third sector? Do you know, we know there are large elements in our area who still aren't claiming the benefits that they're entitled to, do you know, and at, at times it could have been when you do eventually reach people, you find out that there's been involvement from services in the past, but they said, oh, I'll claim it myself, and ultimately they, they, they don't go on to claim it themselves or they find the situation complex. And I think my issue with automation is that if the information isn't right at the very beginning, then obviously people can still miss out then, do you know, and there is complexities of having to, even just the one benefit system where there is things that uh, are like grey areas, do you know, that and Richard explained about the severe disability premium and the carers element for council tax reduction schemes, you know, would a, a system be able to pick that up? Do you know, those grey areas that if you do something of, you have an underlying entitlement to a benefit as opposed to an actual paying of a benefit, you know, will it pick all that type up? All I can say is in 18 years in computing, I never met a pragmatic computer in my life. So, Miss no. <laughs> um, McGuire, I'll bring you in. Thank you, convener. It's kind of following on from, from Jeremy Balfour, and I know that the, the ins and outs of GDPR will be for your information officers, so it's not, it's not really a technical um, question as such. It's just, I, I was interested with um, Ms. Sanif talking about declarations and the, the different points that we're gathering permission for um, folk that, that, that um, live in our areas. And I wonder if GDPR and your new systems provides an opportunity to have a look at what's actually needed in that to, to allow automation or um, your phrase of it to, to, to go ahead and you know I ask this knowing that I think automation is very easy for politicians to sit and go here's a good idea why aren't you doing it you know but recognizing all the complexities that, that you've described in, in your evidence but I just wonder if there's an opportunity with that change because things are going to have to be done differently I think we we all recognize well, bear in mind, I, I, I get a day's training on GDR. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to recall it all. I mean, I think well, there will be opportunities, but there will also be that, you know, you, you try to be proactive, but there will also be that bit of being passive because of what the consequences may be if you don't get it right, you know, um, and what the, it could be for you as an individual or the data controller or ultimately the council. Um, so, so I think it, it certainly be worth exploring do you know that it, if things could be done differently? Do you know? But sometimes, I mean, that it, I mean, our point of view from a DWP, I mean, we could make our consent forms as wide as we would maybe like. Do you know? But then, other organisations, maybe such as DWP, may say, no, you can only use it for this specific reason, for this specific time. And then, once that's done, and maybe rightly so, because you can't go back a year later and say, well, I've still got a mandate for Richard, so that allows me to ask for information. Do you know? So I think you know that it is complicated, and I think it's just trying to get it, it right. But I think if you are going to do automation, then there has to be movement within that area. Uh, and if you, go, if you go the other extreme, whereby what you're asking someone to sign is just so covering, I'm applying for council tax benefit, housing benefit, this benefit, that benefit, something that's yet to be invented. You maybe get to the point where someone goes, well, I've watched all the stuff about Facebook and the media. I'm really wary now of, of giving you that permission. And as a consequence, maybe then don't make their claim or put their claim down before they get advice. So we maybe have to watch, we don't go, go the other way. But if there was some way that legislation could make it legal for that data to be transferred in specified circumstances, as currently is for some other areas. That's maybe, maybe the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Can I just have Yes, sure. Um, you may not be able to answer this, but I'll put it to you anyway. You're picking up any concerns um, so the more successful you are, then the, obviously the bigger the budget needs to be. So if those five and a half thousand children in Glasgow families 
um, if they were to have automatic entitlement. So that would obviously increase the expenditure for the local authority. Uh, are you picking up any concerns within your local authorities about the implications of deeper automation? I'm privy to mm. what worrying folk in different quarters. Uh, if it's money that can be reclaimed from either Scottish Government or, or Central Government, then uh, I suppose that doesn't cause concern. But if it's going to be money that puts pressure on existing stretched local authority budgets, then ultimately that would be a concern. Thank you very much. Is, finally, is, it, is there anything that you want to put on the record that we haven't already covered today? Yeah. Any final thoughts? Well, I suppose the only thing I would like to say is, obviously, for me, automation could only be for some benefits, where it's like straightforward. You know, if you can satisfy a list, then you'd automatically get it. But my fear would be that if you was tried to be developed in the sense of where benefits had discretion. And although I talk about the judgment value, but you know, that's for the straightforward benefits. But if you're looking at a benefit that requires a decision-making process, a thought process, you know, a consideration stuff, then obviously the, the, that could be, to me, quite complex because it, we, we come across people who may have been told by certain folk that they can't claim benefits and they say, well, why not? They were told me I didn't meet the rules and say, well, the people who decide the rules are, are applications are DWP. So, you know, so we would complete the form and send it in and it was up to DWP to decide where, whether they get it or not. But it is straightforward that that could be right. So my concern would just be to say that we have to bear in mind that there, there will be some benefits, particularly disability benefits, DLA, PIP, attendance allowance, do you know, where, where it, it could be quite difficult to get automation. Okay, any final thoughts? Uh, can I thank you all for your attendance this morning and uh, we will now move into private session.